Cha is my daughter's godfather. I don't know if Phyllis Cha is here or not, but these are her godparents. And so these are my, this is my family. And uh, uh, I would almost do whatever he asked me to do. I have that much respect <laughs> for, her, for Dr. Peter Cha, and that's true. So I'm honored to be here. I'm very grateful, and I'm gonna tell you a few things. One is, the older I get, the, the more down to earth I get. And I know, Amy, that must be hard to imagine, because I'm pretty down to earth, period. But I think we're living in a day and time right now that we don't need show offs. We don't need people who come to speak to you to impress you or to show off. We just don't, we're in dire times. Do you hear me? So, so I don't know if y'all talk back to folks here at, at TED's, but, but that silent stare at me is not gonna work out. So, so let me just tell you right now, I need all hands on deck, okay? That means that if you're present, be present. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. All right, so that's where we at, all right? And I'm going to be like this the whole time. So if you feel like, is she going to stay like this? Yes. Yes, I am. So if this is where you should go get coffee, go get coffee. Because I promise you, we need an honors conversation about this topic of reconciliation. And I'm not going to pull back. Because the credibility of the church is on the line. And so I'm not here to entertain a soul. Nobody. I'm, I'm your sister in Christ. And so I, it's hard to say Dr. Salter McNeil is such a mouthful. The students at SPU say Dr. Brenda or Dr. B. Any of those is fine. So if you just don't want to do the whole Salter McNeil thing, that's okay. Dr. Brenda is fine. But Dr. Brenda comes because she's your sister in Christ. More than anything else, I've not come to wow you. I've come to, in hopes, inspire us all to catch a vision of what God might be calling us to in this day and time. And I really believe we need the spirit of God. I used to be embarrassed to say in um, theological context that I grew up in the Pentecostal church. I'm no longer embarrassed. I thank God I grew up in the Pentecostal church. Thank God. Anybody else believe that God rose from the dead and that the spirit of God has been given to the church and that Pentecost is not a fairy tale, but truth? That the spirit of God comes and unifies and mobilizes the people of God for the mission of God. And so it's not about all the study I've done. And I prepared to be with you, but we need God's presence to come. And so I'm going to worship for a minute because, yes, I know it's a lecture, but I also believe that the church needs to give ourselves to this conversation in the presence of God. So are you feeling kind of the vibe we're going to have all night? So if you came for a lecture, I'm sure there's one on campus somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. And if you hurry, you can make it. But if you came to hear from God, now that's what I came for. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Yes, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Lord God, as we continue to pray as prayer has already been offered in this place we say to you that we are desperately in need of the spirit of god come holy spirit and we pray that the conversation we have in this room tonight would be sweet to you that you would be pleased with what you hear from your people 
I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Raise up the church. Raise up the people of God to be on the mission for which you have called us to be. Thank you that you have entrusted us with the ministry of reconciliation. There are days, oh God, that I question why us, because we seem so ill-equipped, but you trust us. So Lord, help us. Give us what we need to be your representatives in the earth, especially in such a divisive climate as the one in which we find ourselves now. Would you please, God, make this night a night that we all leave here sensing that we heard a word from you. Speak, God, for your people are listening. And we declare it so right now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Hey, Phyllis Cha. Well, we did not coordinate this, so me and our wonderful uh, video person or our PowerPoint person, we're going to work on this. So yeah, let's go to the first slide. Let me tell you this. I can still remember the day that I read this strong critique in a book called Dear White Christians. I don't know if you have these moments where uh, you get kind of hit out of the blue by something that you weren't expecting. Someone had said that I should read this book, that they thought it was helpful. Dr. Cha has already said that I teach reconciliation, re recon reconciliation studies, and I was considering whether or not I should use this book for my class. And it had come so highly recommended, I was on a flight. I don't know exactly where I was headed to, but I was on this flight. Flight, and I use flights to kind of get a lot of my reading done, grading done, and it was one of those reading days. And I uh, was on this book, on this plane, reading this book, and uh, began getting to a section in the book where Jennifer Harvey, the author, began talking about what she called prophetic evangelicals. And she had a critique of these dear people, these prophetic evangelicals. Mm -hmm. In her book, she began talking about how prophetic evangelicals were talking about this word reconciliation and that many of us talked about how the uh, 11 to 12 o'clock hour is the most segregated hour on Sunday mornings, right, in the United States. And she said it's almost as if they feel like if Sunday morning wasn't so segregated, uh, we, everything would be just fine. And, and she basically said, but they have not gone far enough. And then she began talking about who these people were who had not gone far enough. Now, once you hear one person's name that you know, you think, huh, isn't that interesting? I know that person. Then two people's names you know, and then five people's names you know, and then a whole paragraph of people you know. And then I thought to myself, I know that woman's not going to call my name in this book. And I flipped the page, and she, she called my name. I was just like, no, she didn't. And Brenda Salter McNeil said, and Urban, I was like, Lord. And it was one of those moments. It was just a wake-up call. And I thought to myself, what? As I read more and as I wrestled with what she was saying and know that I don't doubt my call, nor do I doubt what I was doing before, but I think she had a valid critique of the church. And I think she had a valid critique of how evangelicals have been talking about this issue of reconciliation. And as I read more, I became convinced that we need a new approach that if we're going to become racially transformed communities, we can't keep talking about relational reconciliation that sounds like Kung Kumbaya. Now, that's where anybody could say amen. I'm going to give you help. I'm going to help you. I know it's a lecture, but why don't you pretend it's like church? I'll get better if you get better. So we just can't keep doing this like it sounds like kumbaya. And the church said, amen. because we're losing our credibility. People are tired of us talking about making a friend and meet your neighbor. We are living in times that are way too important for that to be our solution. And she was saying that those prophetic evangelicals, like me, had not gone far enough. So I had what I would call a paradigm shift on that airplane. And I think that that's exactly what she wanted to happen on that plane because she talks about what a paradigm is, right? And so she says that a paradigm Paradigms are powerful, and I believe this to be true. A paradigm might be considered a framework that shapes how we understand a situation, and it's at, at its most 
fundamental level, listen to that again, a paradigm might be considered a framework that shapes how we understand a situation at its most fundamental level. A paradigm contains within it operative assumptions about how we see and comprehend the basic nature of a problem. As a result, it necessarily informs the kind of solutions or responses we identify, as well as which responses we perceive to have the most urgency or even recognize as viable. I had a paradigm shift on that airplane. I've read the book cover to cover and I've med read many others since, but I now understand that that's exactly what Jesus was calling for in the Gospel of Mark chapter 2, verse 21 through 22. This is what the word of God says. No one sews, yes, thank you, my brother. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Listen to Jesus, especially in light of where we are. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wine skins will be ruined. No, he pours. Jesus is calling for a paradigmatic shift. What was going on here was John's disciples came to Jesus and wanted to know why his disciples did not participate in ritualistic fasting like everybody else. Why don't your disciples do what everybody else has been doing? Why don't they follow the paradigm that's been working? And Jesus says to them, not that the old paradigms were wrong. So for anyone who's already wondering if I'm criticizing the church, I am not. Or if I'm criticizing those of us who have historically for over 30 years been calling the church to the work of reconciliation, I am not. I just agree with Jesus that when new wine is being poured out, one must ask themselves, is it now time for a new wine skin? If something new is happening in the earth, Jesus is saying that we can't keep patching up prolonged, old, worn out systems that are ready to be discarded. It's not that they were bad, but they won't work for what we're going through now. Am I making sense? So he answers their questions with analogies. He's basically saying that these traditions which have worked in the past won't work now. They're ineffective. They've lost their ability to create change. So he says to them, he says, let me give you this analogy between old and new things. Let me challenge you to shift your operating assumptions and your perceptions about what we should do. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. In other words, the fresh, creative, energizing move of the Holy Spirit through the followers of Jesus Christ requires new methods, new models new paradigms, new ways of thinking, new approaches, getting out of the box. And that's hard for Christians if the truth be told because traditions have anchored us and informed us and defined us. But I'm telling you, I hear the Lord saying, new wine demands new wineskins. And we cannot continue to assume that what worked then will work now. That would be a good place for an amen. Do I have anybody who came in here? Really? Really? Come on here, Trinity. We done sang and everything. <laughs> yes. 
Praise God. I told you I've come to have a conversation with you, and it helps me to know that you're hearing it and present. And when you say amen, know that I'm not asking for your entertainment. What I believe is that when the church, when the redeemed of the Lord hears what is true, they should say so. Because it's not just about me being brilliant. It's about you as well as me bearing witness to what God might be saying to the church right now. And if you hear it, you should be able to say, now that sounds true. Amen. Agreed. Say that. I'll help you. This is what I believe this new wineskin thing means. I believe that we have to be willing to do things that will look differently. I think that something is shifting in our day and time. Our way of interpreting and responding to what's happening in the world around us must change so that we can respond effectively to whatever this new wine is that God is pouring out. That's why we sang and asked the Holy Spirit to come because I don't believe in our own human logic or our own mental or intellectual skills will we be able to figure out all that God is doing. That's why we need praying people. We do. We need people who press in and say, Lord, speak and give me a heart to stay in your presence to hear you. And no one hears God in a vacuum and nobody hears God all by themselves. We need the community of faith, but we've got to start getting desperate enough to say, speak, Lord, for your children are listening and we need to hear a word from you. And that's, I think, what this new paradigm is going to require of us. These new wineskins, this new paradigm, this new way of thinking about the church is going to challenge us at our core because we're going to have to risk creating new models and new paradigms, and things are going to be different than anything we've ever seen before. And I can't speak for you. I don't like being out of control. I don't necessarily like it when God is all in control and I just have to follow God's radical lead. But I think that's what we're being asked to do. I think we're being asked, like on the day of Pentecost, to know that God is pouring out God's spirit on all flesh, sons and daughters, young and old, those who are servants, socioeconomically diverse. I think God is doing a new thing, and I think the church has to wake up to it and ask to be a part of it. And I'm praying that God will sweep us into it. So one thing that is new, because I don't know if the Lord has ever given you a word, and you keep asking God, what does it mean? And I'm telling you, I literally feel like that verse from Mark is living inside my literal body. I hear it almost all the time. New wine demands new wine skins. And so I've been saying, Lord, what does that mean? And I'm still kind of not sure. I just know that I feel it so true that I could not recant if you demanded it of me. And so I've been saying to the Lord, what's new? Well, one of the things that's new when it comes to how we understand and approach reconciliation is, is, is interesting because I've been saying, Lord, show me newness. So for many people, the concept of reconciliation has grown stale, and that's a new conversation that's beginning to emerge. Have you begun to hear it? More and more people don't even want to use the word. They feel like we have messed it up so bad, and we have that they would prefer to just completely chuck the word. Don't even use the word anymore. They are tired of our relational kumbaya approach that the church has seemed to be using over and over again for all these years. Amen. Some of us have been preaching our guts out about this, and they feel like, and where has it led us? How has it changed how we do things? How has it changed how we approach social and, and political and cultural realities that we live in? They are tired. And so what, 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 what Jennifer Harvey in her book describes as the reconciliation paradigm, they're beginning to find fault with. More and more young people won't even use the term. So if you didn't know that that's happening, let me be the first to alert us here. Amen. That is new on the horizon. So here's what Jennifer Harfrey says about uh, the, what the reconciliation paradigm is. She says the contemporary Protestants view race, uh, view, view race were deeply shaped by the civil rights movement. And she says that we, we targeted the problem of segregation right? That that was our primary concern, that we were so concerned with trying to make sure that people came together, that segregation was no longer the reality. That's why we continue to quote the 11 to 12 o'clock on Sunday morning adage. 
One of the primary sins of segregation was that it violated human unity and destroyed the possibility of real human community. So as a result, the focus of the reconciliation paradigm, so says Harvey, became interracial unity and togetherness with the belief that racism would be eradicated by diverse people coming together. So we were sincere when we said that the 11 to 12 o'clock hour was the most segregated hour on Sunday morning in the United States. We were sincere because we thought if we could come together, this diverse multicultural church movement, amen, would somehow eradicate racism. How are we doing on that? The problem being that this lacks an understanding, says Harvey, of the particularity required for different racial groups based on historical and social realities. I'm just gonna let you sit with that for a minute. She's saying we basically called everybody to come to the table of, of, of brother and sisterhood together, and we would all be one. But we never talked about the historical and social realities that divided us in the first place. And she's saying, so we started by, let's just all come together and let's all be the family of God. But we never talked about what things caused that not to be true in the first place. So for her, the problem with this approach is when people talk about reconciliation, it sometimes means, I think we got this on the next slide, ignoring historical realities. It comes down to, we don't even talk about how we got here. I heard somebody say, uh, his name is Brian Stevenson, and I'll talk to, about him in a minute, but uh, later in this talk, but he said, you know, it almost sounds like the, 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 uh, the, the civil rights movement happened in three steps, you know? Uh, Rosa Parks sat down, Martin Luther King marched, and we got reconciled. And, and nothing about lynching, nothing about voter suppression, nothing. Nothing about Jews in the United States, nothing about Native Americans, nothing about Mexico and Los Angeles and Texas, nothing about the realities of what happened to whom. We just got reconciled. Isn't it wonderful? So it ignores historical realities, it ignores differences because somehow it seems like we're all same on the inside. So we come to, so we invite people to come to my table or come to my church, which really means you're welcome, but if you come, you're basically gonna have to become more like us. And more importantly, we begin asking the wrong questions to diagnose the problem. Because if the problem is that we should just come together, then we just ought to have more multicultural churches. And don't you notice that of late we have a lot of them? It's in vogue. I counsel a lot of folks who have started, and I'm all for it. I attend a multicultural church, and it is a wonderful thing. But just coming together and being able to sing songs in Spanish and Korean and, you know, uh, what every now and then in different languages is not necessarily producing the people of God on mission to cause the kingdom of God to come on earth as it is in heaven. And so something needs to shift. This shallow understanding of reconciliation that leads to simplistic answers to very complex problems has led to a negative impact on everybody, including on white identity. My students in my classrooms who take reconciliation studies, and I don't know if you can relate, but many of the students who come from white culture really have uh, had to wrestle with how growing up in a society where we've had what's called racialization embedded in so many systems and so many structures, how it not just oppresses some people, but it's almost like everybody who's in pollution ends up having the effects of pollution in their lungs too. And so on white identity, there's a negative impact on everybody living in this racialized society. For whites, it's impossible to fully internalize the concept of whiteness as being good. So many of my students feel like I don't even wanna come to a reconciliation conversation because I feel like I'm only gonna come in through the door of feeling guilty. 
This produces guilt that paralyzes, causing denial and silence and inactivity. And it also limits whites' abilities to work toward reconciliation and racial justice. Because if you're paralyzed, if you feel like there's no way that you can get in the con conversation without feeling blame or shame and responsibility, then you back away from it, feeling like, I don't want to do the wrong thing, so I'll do no thing. Therefore, it's necessary to take the implications of whiteness more seriously in order to become racially transformed communities. So remember I talked to you about this notion of new wineskins? This is one of the new wineskins that I think is starting to emerge in the conversation. Now, literally, I need to ask you, and so I'm seriously, have you begun to hear people talking more about white supremacy and the importance of grappling with what whiteness means? Part of what people are saying is that it's not enough to keep asking people of color, tell me your story. I want to get to know your narrative. I, please tell me more about your culture. Because it's almost been our approach that if I can learn more about the other, then that's what reconciliation requires. But the new conversation that seems to be emerging, that's starting to come out of the church, is that we've got to start unpacking whiteness, too. Yes, give her a free book. I wish I brought something free. I would give you free stuff right now. Amen. You see, something new is emerging. And we've got to be careful about new stuff. I feel like I'm going to preach for a second, so I'm going to step over here right quick. Because on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God broke through, the people who saw God break through but didn't understand it said they are drunk. They were confused. And let me tell you, when we start having this new conversation, people are going to think we're nuts. And if they haven't already thought it, they're gonna. That's right. The second we start shifting this conversation to begin moving toward a new paradigm, they're going to think I'm crazy and you're crazy for listening to me. But then Peter has to stand up and say, this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. We are not drunk as you suppose. It's too early in the morning. <laughs> If we had more time, maybe, but <laughs> but this is God. This is a new thing. And I'm begging you at Trinity to have courage when you hear this conversation not to go to silence and pretend when people say, I can't imagine they're talking about whiteness. What's that all about? I hope you'll have the courage to stand up and say like Peter, whose knees were probably knocking on the day of Pentecost. He had never done a sermon prior to that. And he had to jump in and basically say, nope, this is God. This is God. What you call confusion, I call a catalyst for change. This is God. This is God breaking in with a new wine. Something new is happening, and it's going to cause something new of us. And I believe that this conversation toward unpacking whiteness is an example of the new thing that's being poured out in our generation. So one example of this new thing is a new book that's come out by a dear brother, friend, mentee of mine who I love dearly. His name is Daniel Hill. And he wrote a book, and I wrote the foreword. That's how come that's up there. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't just trying to show off, and I couldn't get a better picture, so it's over there. So, but this is what what uh, I wrote in his forward, and I still believe this to be radically true. White awake is a call to find our deepest sense of identity in Christ, but also to realize that those who are white can't get there without breaking free of the distorted sense of identity they have internalized from the narrative of racial difference. All of us have been harmed by a racist society, not just but everybody. In short, we need a new paradigm that takes the problem of whiteness more seriously, that helps churches become racially transformed communities. This new shift is what many people call a reparations paradigm. Now, I know we don't generally like that word, but let me tell you what this seems to focus on, and again, this comes from Jennifer Harvey's book. She says that the reparations paradigm focuses on attending to uh, structures for repair and redress, the same structures through which race is constructed, the same structures to which we have different relationships, is the path we need to pursue to live into the reconstructed interracial relationships that we long for. 
This approach knows that work to repair will always be partial. It will never be truly, we will never be able to truly undo the material implications or historical racial injustice. Uh, let's see, but what justice and repair must look like. So it's important to note that work to repair will always be partial, and I agree with her, meaning we will not God on earth until the return of Christ. So what we do will always be partial, but I think she's right. It will never be able to truly undo the material implications of the historical racial injustice, but demonstrates what justice as repair could look like. And that's way better than kumbaya. Would you agree? So I know that right now you probably need a chance to catch your breath. And so let me tell you a story. This next picture is of a man named Brian Stevenson. He wrote a book called Just Mercy. Brian Stevenson is a civil rights lawyer. He started an organization in Montgomery, Alabama called the Equal Justice Initiative. I love him. I respect him. I've known him for a long time. He's a Christian. Many people don't know that. And he's given his entire life to helping uh, uh, get people who have been wrongly convicted uh, and sentenced to life on death row. Um, or dead, sentenced to be killed on death row, many of whom are languishing in life's long sentences. He has been giving his life to getting those people released from prison. I met one of them, uh, one of those people, Mr. Anthony Ray Hinton, and it was almost as if I met an angel unawares. It was quite magnificent to meet this man who was on death row for 30 years for a crime he did not commit. And for 15 years, the state of Alabama knew he did not do it but they didn't want to spare, go through the expense of having a new trial. So, uh, and I should say, Brian Stevenson went to Eastern, Eastern College in St. David's, Pennsylvania Christian College, and uh, was, was one of my, my, my husband's roommates. So we go way, way, way back. Um, so this is, he was just a guy back then, now he's real famous. And uh, so now I'm like, yo, yo, you remember me? No, no I don't. <laughs> he was in Seattle, Washington. He's given a talk. And he did brilliantly. At the end, people erupted in, in applause. And then there was a question and answer time. Now, this, this room that, was, um, that had Brian Stevenson there was a major assembly hall that was packed to the gills, no space in it. And, um, I wasn't sure if I could go because I hadn't purchased a ticket in advance and I kind of knew people who were going, but I had waited till the last minute to try to get in. But there was a young man um, who I had befriended and I had done a favor for. He came to Seattle Pacific University and um, he took me on about why he thought I should talk more about reparations. And I gave him the mic and I let him talk and he couldn't believe that somebody would let somebody actually talk publicly who was differing with them because you're supposed to be defensive and not be nice. And he was like, you're nice. And I, I am nice. <laughs> and so he had affection for me. He saw uh, me trying to figure out if there were any more tickets and he said, Dr. Brenda, psst, I can get you in. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm a part of the planning committee. Follow me. So I march in. I march in with my boy, who I began dubbing Brother Reparations. I, that's just my new name for him. And, and so Brother Reparations got me in. I was sitting like on the third row, and he was right in the front. And so after Brian Stevenson finished his talk, people clapping, 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 he looked at his watch, and he said, hey, we've got a little time left. How about we take some questions and answers? And so the first hand up was Brother Reparations. Bam. And so I was sitting next to someone who we had chatted a bit, and I said, I said, I don't know what he's going to ask, but by the end of it, it's going to have something to do with reparations. <laughs> and so his hand went up, and so Brian Stevenson said, yes, yes, yes. And he said, Mr. Stevenson, do you believe in reparations? <laughs> he just cut to the chase. And I will never forget how Brian Stevenson responded. He said, of course I do, but anybody can write a check. He said, real reparations would be to repair what got broken. 
He said, for example, African-American people were denied the right to vote. He said, to repair that, we should allow every African-American person in this country to be registered to vote automatically on their 18th birthday. He said, now that would fix it. That would fix what was broken. He said, in fact, if you were an elderly African-American person, we'd come pick you up, <laughs> drive you to vote. And I thought, I mean, have you ever been in a talk where like the whole heavens open up and you like see God? And I'm telling you, when I left that room and got in my car, I told you I was Pentecostal. I heard the Lord say, Isaiah 58, verse 12. And that verse began to ring in my spirit. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called... That's us. That's us. We are the repairers of the breach. We are not supposed to be the people who are afraid of the reparations paradigm. We the reparations people. Oh, somebody say amen. Help us, sister, out. This is where the church should say we are the repairers. That's what reparations means, to repair something. Not to clap around it, not to hold hands about it, not to sing a song about it, but to fix that which has been separated, to fix that which has been broken. We have been called to be the repairers of the breach. And that began to shape my new conversations. This is the second time that I have publicly said this, but I am convinced with all my heart that this is part of the new thing God is doing in the earth right now. That night was a catalytic event for me, and it woke me up to the reality that the way I preach about reconciliation must include this notion of repair. We've talked way too long about relational things and not enough about the things that are broken that need to be fixed. Amen. Amen. The reconciliation paradigm, so says Jennifer Harvey, seems to assert that those who are white and people of color have parallel differences in our racial brokenness. And that's not true. So if we had to compare the two, right, it seems to suggest in this reconciliation paradigm, it targets segregation as our central problem of racism. And that's not just the problem. Advocates of this reconciliation paradigm advocates a pursuit of racial togetherness across lines lines of racial difference as a central ethic in Christian life through which racism will be eradicated. And I also said that racial diversity remains the primary way that justice, justice committed Christians measure the achievement of racial reconciliation. Now in a second, I'm going to say something that's important for me to say, but let me come over here and say this. This is what she calls the reparations paradigm. It requires us to take seriously the repair of the actual harm done. It requires us to engage a particularistic ethic that insists that we respond to our distinct relationships to injustice. It means that it, we mean, it means that we have to allow those who are white to redeem white identity through confession and participating in racial justice. And it also means that we have to repair our interracial relationships by redressing the structures that mediate those relationships and harm our racial lives. That's what we've got to fix. That's what we've got to repair. It doesn't mean that we somehow take people's stuff like Robin Hood and give to somebody else. It means that we approach this problem of divisiveness in our society by saying, what's been broken? How were we a part of whatever got broken and how do we begin to engage it? I thought about when kids uh, fight or make mistakes and say we're parents and one little kid, let's make it a little boy, was playing with his sister's truck. And she said, don't play with my truck, but her little brother loved it so much because it was shiny. He grabs the truck, he plays with it, and oops, he drops it and the wheel falls off. So the daughter, now the little girl does what? She cries. 
you broke my drug, right? And rightly so. So then the parent comes in because there's a hubbub going on. And so the parent says to the little boy, after we re realize what happened, the truck is broken, and mom or dad will say, okay, say you're sorry. And if you were anything like me as a kid, you kind of cough up a sorry, you know? It's really not the most, in, you know, sincere sorry you ever said in your life. So you just kind of say something like, sorry. And then the parent can instinctively know that's not going to do. So then the parent says something like, sorry for what? And then the little boys will say, I'm sorry. I broke your truck. I know you told me not to play with it. I didn't know that the wheel was broken, and I didn't mean for it to fall off, and so I shouldn't have touched it because you told me not to touch it, and, and I'm sorry I broke it. Now the little girl is starting to collect herself, and, and she says, okay. And then mom or dad says, now, Peter, you know how we were gonna go out and get ice cream? We're not gonna be able to get ice cream for you today because your ice cream money, we're gonna use that to get your sister a new truck. And so, Peter has confessed, he's apologized, he's repaired what was broken. And so next week, little sister doesn't get to come back or have a conversation about the truck. You see, he's been freed from constantly feeling guilty. He's been freed from walking under a cloud of shame, always about the truck. She knows that he's apologized. She's forgiven him for what's happened. He's made restitution in some way for the truck. Mom probably had to put some money in there to make the truck thing come up. Ice cream money probably wasn't enough. But but a new truck comes. She gets something, and they're able to now be brother and sister again and keep it moving. Do you see how repair helps people not get stuck in the guilt and the shame? But if we keep doing this, I didn't do anything wrong. Why do you keep blaming me? We're not going to move forward. But if people get a chance to say, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I get what happened. And then I'm able to say, thank you for owning that. And then you say, what can I do to help fix that? And then we're able to be brother and sister and move forward. Thank you. And so this is what I want to say. And I don't know. Let me see. Let me take a few more minutes and close this down. I sincerely believe that we must move beyond relational reconciliation to develop a broader vision of reconciliation. There is a Catholic priest who I've come to really appreciate. His name is Father Robert Schreider, taught in Chicago. Yeah, I think at Catholic Theological Seminary, and I love his writing. I love his books. I use them in my classroom. And this is what um, Father, Ryder, Ryder, F Father Robert Schreider says. He emphasizes the need for a theology of reconciliation that rests on the urgent need to rebuild ravaged societies and human relationships, to heal memories of horror and degradation. The healing of victims' humanity and restoration of justice in a broken society destroyed by violence and oppression are basic characteristics of what Schreider calls the horizontal dimension of reconciliation. And my brothers and my sisters, that's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul says that we have been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. And so we preach a lot about the vertical truth of the cross, but the truth is when we got reconciled back to God, we also got reconciled to each other. All this is from God, says the scripture who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. reconciliation. That is in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. We are called to preach and demonstrate both the vertical and the horizontal reality of the cross. That's the message we've been entrusted with. And may I please say, without taking any partisan side, that is the travesty that's happening right now in our country with the church and our complicity and whatever's going on politically. 
People don't trust the gospel anymore because whatever we're doing to win on whatever side we've taken has so denigrated the gospel of Jesus Christ that people don't want to be around a church. And if the truth be told, I don't blame them. And so I mean it. We have been entrusted with this. And when we don't do this, it destroys the credibility of the claims of Christ. That's why I preach so hard, because our evangelism is in the balance during this day and time. There are people around the world who are looking at us, and they are questioning the gospel we preach. Reconciliation is more than building relationships and holding hands together. It means coming together to repair broken systems that impede people from reaching their full God-given potential. But let me hasten to say this really quickly. I want you to know that I am not suggesting that somehow that, that the word reconciliation needs to be thrown out, that we shouldn't use it anymore, that we need to go to reparations because reconciliation is bad. I mean, reparations because reconciliation is old hat. Ah, contraire. So, yes, get this on film, get this on tape, t t tweet this. The Bible says that the word we have been given theologically, the concept that has been trusted to us, is a theological concept called reconciliation, katalasso. We have been called to this great exchange that causes death, life to come out of death. That's what the cross is all about, that those of us who lose our lives find it, and if we would lose our lives for Christ's sake and not try so hard to grab for power and win, life would come out of it, and people would be transformed, and the world would see the gospel realized, and the kingdom of God would be seen on earth as it is in heaven. So we can't just throw out the word reconciliation because we don't like what we did to it. We've got to repair what we did to it, reclaim what we did to it, and begin to preach it the way it was supposed to be preached. So I am not advocating a sociological corrective to a theological problem. We need to have a theological answer to a theological word, and I do agree that we do need to repair it, but that doesn't mean that we trash reconciliation in the process. Am I making sense? Give God a hand clap right there, because we need to get that that together because what's happening is social justice minded people are basically saying we're not even going to talk about reconciliation anymore we're going to talk about white supremacy and reparations and we're just going to chuck the church and I'm saying church rise up and reclaim what it was supposed to be tell folk what we used to say in this song we used to sing in my church Lord forgive us for the thing we made it because it's all about you and I think we should say God forgive us for what we did to reconciliation it was right when you gave it to us and we messed it up but we're trying to come back to the heart of worship and we're going to reclaim what it was supposed to be in the beginning we're going to start preaching it and living it, and we're going to reclaim the, the, the credibility of the word reconciliation. We're not going to throw it away. We're going to repent. That's what we're going to do. We're going to repent. We're going to turn around and go in the direction you called us to in the first place. I'm preaching. I know I am. <laughs> I have lost my place. What comes next? So this is what reconciliation was supposed to be. We can't say that we love people and not care about the policies that affect them. You see, we have so moved away from what reconciliation meant that I care about God. And because I believe that God loves all people, I care about you. I believe that God wants for you the same things that God wants for me. If God wants to feed my children, God wants to feed your children. If God doesn't want your children to drink lead poisoned water, God doesn't want my children children to drink lead poison water that's why we care about health care that's why we care about mass incarceration that's why we care about education and immigration reform and environmental justice and gender equality because we have been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation that is both vertical and horizontal, horizontal. and when we don't do that we cause offense to the cross so this is not just a political issue. This is what reconciliation was supposed to be about. It was never supposed to be the Kumbaya Club. So I want you to tell you one more story. Let's go to the next slide. What does it look like then? What would it look like for the church to say, I repent? 
I get it. I agree. We have been entrusted with the Ministry of Reconciliation. Well, let me tell you this. In 2001, a non-native evangelical Christian community in Eureka, California, they decided to purchase 1.5 acres of land at $1,000 that had been forcibly taken from the Wyatt people in the mid-1800s, and they gifted it to them as an act of partial repair. They said, we know we can't give you all of California back, which probably belonged to you. <laughs> it probably was yours, amen. But at this point, we have taken over too much, so, but we're going to give you at least back this 1.5 acres. The Wyatt people claim that this reconciliation meet meeting paved the way for the city council to return 40 acres back to that tribe in 2004. You see, that's what reconciliation looks like. It looks like understanding that we can't say that God loves people and not show the love of God in very tangible, life-changing, transformative ways. And that causes people to give glory to our God in heaven. So as I conclude, and then you can talk to me about anything, I am convinced, this is the next slide, I'm convinced that our, anthro our theology informs our anthropology, and our anthropology informs our sociology. By that I mean, what we believe about God will tell us what we believe about people, and what we believe about people will tell us what type of society we believe we should be trying to create. What we'll vote for, what we'll advocate for, what we'll look for, what we will not tolerate. I wish I had time to tell you that I learned when I was in South Africa almost seven years ago to this day. I was at the Lausanne Congress of World Evangelization in Cape Town, South Africa. I went to Stellenbosch University, and guess what I learned? I learned that apartheid did not start as a political concept. It started in the School of Theology at Stellenbosch University. Because what you believe about God will tell you what you believe about people. And what you believe about people will tell you whether or not you think you're supposed to have a society that segregates people or not. And that's why those of us who are studying theology need to do good work. Because it impacts everything. So here's what I believe about God. I believe that God wants all people to flourish. I believe that God has enough for all people. And I believe that God wants all people to reach their full God-given potential. And that's why I had to come up with my own definition of reconciliation and a process to try to suggest what I think it looks like. I believe that we've got to repair reconciliation. I believe that the goal is not helping whites feel less guilty. I believe we're supposed to repair broken systems together. So that night that I left from uh, Brian Stevenson's talk, those of you who have my book, and I still stand by my book, do not give it back. I still believe, <laughs> I believe this is right. But in the book it says, actively working for reconciliation, and that's true, but not enough. When I left that talk with Brian Stevenson and I heard that scripture from Isaiah chapter 58, I have changed actively working for reconciliation to repairing broken systems together. That's what I think activation looks like. It looks like a shift. So here's my definition and I'll quit. This is what I believe reconciliation is. I believe that it's no longer about one person being the, the, stage, the sage on the stage who is brilliant. I believe this. I believe that reconciliation is an ongoing spiritual process involving forgiveness, repentance, and justice that transforms broken relationships and systems to reflect God's original intention for all creation to flourish. That's what I believe God has raised us up to be about. Anything less is not the kingdom of God. And my prayer is that we would be kingdom people. Let me pray, and then you can ask me anything you like. Lord God, I thank you for this opportunity to share my heart. I thank you so much for what you want to do in this day and time. I thank you that new wine demands new wineskins. And I thank you that you're beginning to birth in us a new vision for what we could do and be in this day and time. Come Holy Spirit, give us courage and bravery beyond our own skills. Help us to be willing to be countercultural, and may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, for we ask you to do it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, first, I want to say thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be in conversation with you and to have you on our campus. Um, so thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and thank you for the interaction. Um, so my question is, I'm processing your reparations component. Huh? And I think, just to let you know, I'm with you. I'm there with you. <laughs> I think, but especially politically, questions. I'm there with you. Ask well, I don't good questions, so I'm happy yeah. for you to do that. So I'm here as a conversation partner. Yep. Um, so I, as, uh, as a white person, I think, who's been on a journey of, of trying to figure out what to do with my privilege, um, I think every day I'm going to wake up and still be white, that's obvious, but to still have my privilege too. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't, I don't know if there's ever anything that, and I, I, I've been on the journey long enough to not feel good, you know, like I've worked through some of those things, but I don't think there's ever gonna be a day where I can repair mm -hmm. all the damage that's been done or repay what I am given each new day because I'm white and I'm male and you know, everything else that affords me privilege. So, yeah, so just help me think through what this looks like, and especially theologically. Um, yeah. Yeah. Here's what I would say. First, tell me your first name, please. Preston. Hey, Preston. Um, I believe names are important. I think it's a reconciliation skill just to honor people by knowing names and being able to honor folks by saying you're more than just a hey you. And so, Preston, this is what I would say. The, convert, the question is, is, is more complex than a quick answer. That's why I referred to that book, White Awake. I think that there has to be a way that other people who are white wrestle with this. And it's so new that I don't think it's been wrestled with enough. And so just to say, hey, you know, apologize for dropping the truck. It's way more complex than that. And so I would start by saying, use a tool like that. He, Daniel Hill lives in Chicago. So I would say that's the next conversation to have, right? And perhaps invite somebody like that and have that conversation with the person who's wrestling in the same way. Do, does that make sense? There's other folks who I think who might be resources to you in that regard. So I don't think it's like the... Hey, here's the answer. But I do think this, that in the truck analogy, when people feel like they're working to help fix what is broken, it gives them a way forward other than just feeling paralyzed in guilt. Because that's not helping to move the needle toward changing the systems that are hurting people's lives, right? But you're right. Remember I read that slide that said it's always going to be partial. It's never gonna be where we all feel like, yeah, okay, finally. But I think we can begin to feel like we're more on the right side of the kingdom than not by the ways we begin to interact. But I think it's gonna take some more conversation. So I'd say start with Wide Awake and perhaps have conversation partners with you around that conversation. And you have resources in Chicago. I have a friend here, his name is Pastor David Swanson, um, who has been wrestling with this, would you mind? He's a dear friend, we're gonna hang out afterwards and he's the pastor of New Community Church in Bronzeville. And so go to visit his church. I mean, Daniel Hill's got a church and because it's not gonna be, remember I said that the day of the single superstar is over? So whatever the answer to your question is, Preston, is not gonna be by yourself. I think you gotta roll with a crew. <laughs> yes, I think you gotta find a church where there's a white pastor who's trying to do right and get around them and think, oh, that's what it looks like. Because unless you see it in operation and see somebody trying to live it in a way that you feel like you could emulate, I think it's gonna always be hard to know how do you fit this into your skin? But I think there's a way forward and I think there are more people trying it. I think you just need to get around them a little bit. Does that make sense? Helpful? And you can always say no too. I say to my students, education is not indoctrination. So, so you can disagree and kind of say, I think so, but so if you use an I statement, I think, I disagree, I like, I is just fine. Cause that's, you know, it's just, um, you can be, you can say hard things and it still sounds sweet when you say, I'm having problems with that. I could hear that. If you feel like, how dare you? Now I can't hear that. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Brenda, for uh, the 
just the, the message that you brought tonight. My name's Jody. I am currently working on my PhD in education here. <laughs> um, and I would love to hear, because you've had the experience, um, how do you flesh this out in a classroom context? Mm -hmm. And when you say how, when you say how do I flesh it out, how do I flesh out what part of it? So um, how you understand reconciliation. Um, yeah. Like what, and I know that's a broad question, mm -hmm. but I would love to just anything that you could offer, I will gladly take. Okay. <laughs> well, right now I'm teaching Introduction to Reconciliation Studies, and so I'm, I, I, the, I, we begin by teaching Divided by Faith. It came out in 2000, but it's still one of the most helpful tools by uh, Michael Emerson and Christian Smith to help us understand the evangelical worldview. How do we see the world, and therefore how do we begin to move towards solutions based upon our worldview? Many students have never thought that through, right? Then we try to do a lot of experiential learning. So there's something called the race race. Have you heard of it? It's like some people call it the privilege walk, but it's basically that whole process of causing people to simulate what a society where certain people are advantaged and other people are not actually feels like. Usually students break down and cry because there are people in that in that race race or whatever we call a privilege walk who they literally know as their classmates or their professors if I'm in the race, I am, I am their professor, but I'm not at the front of the race. And it, it's the first time that they come face to face with the reality that a person with a doctorate degree would probably not be at the front of the line. So I don't think reconciliation is something that can be taught just cerebrally. I think it has to be taught both experientially as well as intellectually so that people can begin to put the connections together. And then I think they can begin to enter into the conversation with less of a defensive and more of a, why didn't I ever know this before? And I think all of us should be asking ourselves, why didn't I ever know this before? Like, I, there was a movie out called Hidden Figures. Did anyone go see it? All of us should wonder, how did that much history not get taught to any of us? And then it makes us approach education with a new hunger because we realize if, that, if we didn't hear that, what else didn't we hear? And that's what I think makes people hunger to know it from a different perspective. I hope that's helpful. I'll just say while the mic is going down, I called out David and, and, and Dr. Peter Cha uh, because if somebody else wants to jump in and says, I want to say something, well, just raise your hand because <laughs> I would happily give you this mic, because remember, I told you that the day of the single superstar is over. And so it's not just what I know. Some of these folks have wisdom in the room, and I just wanted to introduce you to them just in case they start talking. You know that I've invited them to do so. OK? Yeah. Hi. Uh, Tell thanks. me your first name. Uh, I'm Chris. Hi, Chris. Um, so once again, thanks for all your words. It was, it was very enlightening. Um, so when you, when you started talking about how um, reconciliation has kind of become old hat for some people, mm -hmm. that was kind of news to me. <laughs> um, so, and sort of in that vein, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, are there places in our country where um, even the, the initial conversation that's already been had and become old in some places hasn't even really started? And so is there room for, um, so, so do we need a, a, a paradigm shift even for, for those places where it, reconciliation has yet to be really introduced? Or is, it, is what we were previously talking about, is that kind of okay as sort of like the, the milk that we give first before we're ready for solid food? Yeah, um, interesting. So. All right, but David, come on up front. Come on up front. Peter Chow, what do you think? <laughs> when it's hard, I'm going to pass the mic. <laughs> Well, so Chris, you know, you were you're in my so, you were in my social cultural exegesis class, and and what he's talking about is really true. So many in that class never even thought about issues of race really seriously, and for them, the challenge is really thinking about really even thought about worshiping with someone who looks very different than you is a huge leap and a challenge. So in some ways, I appreciated that analogy of milk that you used. It's just that 
This reconciliation ministry has been very trendy in many evangelical circles for now 20 plus years. We just never went beyond that kindergarten, so to speak, and moving up to the cause that separated us that uh, Dr. Brenda has talked about. So in some ways, maybe that's one way to think about it. It's a journey, mm -hmm. right? We have to start somewhere, and we have to be appropriate for the folks who are at a certain place in their journey without patronizing them. But then for those who've been on this journey for a while, we should certainly not limit ourselves in terms of just staying in that same area, right? I think this is mean to him. <laughs> Um, I think it's a, uh, so, uh, I think yes and no. Um, I think no, because I think what, what Reverend Dr. Brenda has articulated is not so much um, a, a new starting point as it is a new paradigm. And so I think, the, I think that paradigm is applicable across the board. And I think if we continue to uh, perpetuate a model that is, um, that's, that begins and ends only with personal relationships, that we are setting people who are new to the conversation up for what we're experiencing right now. Um, and the yes part of my uh, answer is that we're Christian people, which means that reconciliation is always relational. And so as much as we talk about systems and structures, um, if we ever stop talking about flesh and blood, it's no longer a Christian uh, model of reconciliation. And so I actually think that friendship is a vastly underutilized sort of theological category when it comes to reconciliation because it's always person to person. Um, and, and what race does, of course, is it makes it uh, hard or impossible to engage person to person. Uh, we don't actually see the image of God in front of us and, and vice versa. And so as, as, as we lean, and I think rightly so, uh, into uh, a more kind of justice-oriented, uh, reparative model, uh, it, I do think it would cease to be Christian if we don't always uh, include the, the relationship and the friendship uh, as, a, as a part of it. Who knows? You might have something else. And, and Dr. Is it Jody or Joni? Jody. Jody. Dr. Jody? I'm, I, I, yes, Dr. Jody, because we're going to do this PhD, right? Did you notice what just happened when you said, how do you teach it? The other thing about reconciliation is you have to embody it. So it's not just what I know. You see, if I say that the day of the single superstar is over, but I am the single superstar, so I do things that I don't even realize is a, a, a intentional, but it is intentional for me. I really do believe that the day of the single superstar is over. So when you teach reconciliation, I think that for me, I co-teach with others, right? I have a male person, a white male, who co-teaches with me in the, in the right now in our intro class. I teach with someone from the John Perkins Center who's a staff person. Her name is Kanisha, and she's been at SPU longer than I have, but she's grown up in Seattle, so she knows what the CCDA models are in Seattle of community development, and she gets students in internships. So if we believe that, we've got to model it in the classroom. Hello, thank you uh, for letting me ask this question. My name is Rashid Davis. I'm here with a bunch of friends from the, the chapel at the church back here. <laughs> Represent hard chapel. And we, uh, we recently, uh, not even recently, it's been almost a year now, started a uh, racial reconciliation conversation group mm -hmm. and we're at a point where we're trying to figure out the, I guess it's the reparations part of it you know what's next what, what are we doing but I begin myself personally having conversations with other friends white friends about uh, racial reconciliation and what it looks like and I, I was asked this question um, what three things would you want white people to know this was asked by an, a white friend of mine to myself and Quickly, the one, one thing that I thought was, um, for me, uh, the first thing that popped in my head was, it's not your fault. You know, that race is uh, society right now, and, and racism is what it is in the United States, right? Okay. Um, it's not your fault. Um, so don't take offense to what I'm saying. 
I'm almost gonna stop you in a second. Okay. Not, not because, not because I don't need to hear all three. I wanna, t wanna stop you for a second. May I? Yes. And, yes. and this is something I don't often do. You please stay, stay. Um, Rashid, I was in graduate school, and this is important for me to say to you. I was in graduate school at Fuller Seminary, and I was upset about something, right? I don't even remember what it was, but my friend, his name was Roland, saw me from a distance, mm -hmm. and he could see that I was upset. And he came up to me, I told him whatever it was, and he said this, and I wanna say it to you. He said, the wrong question will always lead to the wrong answer. Mm. He said, Brenda, it's more important that you ask yourself, am I asking the right question? Okay. So tell me that question again. Uh, what three things? The first thing he said was, what do you want uh, what white three people to know? What do you want white people to know? Wrong question. Years. Got it. I wouldn't, your three things? Uh -huh. The wrong question so what's the will right always question? leave. Yes, now that's the right question. That's the right question. The wrong question will always lead to the wrong answer. So what three things do you want white people to know? I would say if I could put you in little groups right now, based upon what you heard tonight, what would be a better question? Let's, let's let the group think. Since the day of the sing single superstar is over, give that man the mic. What would be a better question? Other than what, what three things do you want white people to know based upon this lecture tonight? And then I'm going to go. I'm going to go home. Fix this thing. Help Rashi. What, a, what is another? What would be a better question than what three things do you want white people to know? Can you hear that that ain't the best question in the whole wide world? Because is this about trying to get white people to know something different? Okay, so what would be a better question? Let's help Rashid. They're gonna hook you up. <laughs> yes, what? <laughs> see, see if I've under, understood. It's like, what can we do together <gasps> to, to change the impact of, of our history? Is that a better question, Saints? Yes! What could we do together? Write these down, Rashid. You're gonna go back brilliant, man. You're gonna go back brilliant. What things could we do differently to together to address our history? Yeah! What else? Come on. You were in the same lecture she was in? Yes! <laughs> Make him run. <laughs> Oftentimes, maybe white people aren't aware of how they're contributing to something that's already going on. So maybe you start asking yourself, if this is real, then how am I contributing to this problem, or how am I helping the solution? So, yeah. Is that better, everybody? <laughs> Clap your hands for better. Yes, Rashi. Do you hear that? Repeat that one. Okay, repeat that one. Y'all help him take notes, chap. We'll help him take notes. One of the notes. questions I would throw back in was what you need to be asking yourself. The question is, how are you contributing to this problem uh, of, of you know, a racial being in a racialized society, and and what are you, and how are you helping to solve it? So, what is your, you know, what is your call in this? Yes. Or reconciliation process or repairing process. Yes. Okay. Good. Let me get one more. Yes, sir. Here, I'll pass in my mic. I feel like a fish that's being asked, what is it like to be wet? And as a white person, I need to understand my whiteness. How, 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 would, I, how would I discover my wetness, if you would? How would I discover my whiteness privilege, um, and gain a perspective on that. What's your first name? Mark. Hey, Mark. Yeah. That's the right question. Yeah. David's going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Go get him, Jeff. <laughs> I thought we were friends, too. <laughs> I, th I think, um, I don't remember the statistics off the top of my head, but it's, it's somewhere l l that 80%, 85% like uh, of white people have no people of color at all in their social networks. That, that white people more than anybody else are, are more segregated um, by far than anybody else in, in our country. 
um, there, there's no way to understand my whiteness if I'm only with white people. So again, I'm going back to flesh on flesh. Um, there's plenty of things to read. There's plenty of documentaries to watch. There's a, lots of ways to be informed. But um, un until uh, what has felt like water to me, until what has felt like neutral air to me um, becomes experientially uh, different uh, by virtue of being uh, located and in relationship with people who are not white, um, it will be impossible for me to understand what it is to be white. Uh, but when I uh, am welcomed into spaces that are not predominantly white and where the norms and assumptions of whiteness are not uh, supreme uh, or, or invisible, um, then all of a sudden I can begin to think about uh, and, and experience what it is to be white. And within the context of a church, uh, I can do that in a way that I think is, I can, I can be, step into that journey in a way that's actually very humanizing uh, because it's a space that's hospitable and that, and that sees me beyond my whiteness. Uh, so I think for the white person on this journey to be in those spaces is actually to, be, to get more in touch with my own humanity uh, because I, I begin to see myself and experience myself in ways that I have been unable, this is one of the destructive things that whiteness does, that I've been unable to do by thinking of myself only as, as, as Baldwin would say, um, thinking of myself as being white, when in fact I am certainly much more than that. This is gonna be my last one. I'm gonna go home. Um, and, right, and so thank you to everyone. But I'm hoping that this generates conversation that you wanna keep having, and I think you can continue to have it. Rashid, I wanted to say to you, I heard the Lord inside my heart say, you know how when somebody would ask Jesus a question and Jesus would say, you, I hear your question, but let me ask you a question. So he would answer a question with a question. I want you to develop that skill because you're a good man and you've got a good heart. But I think when somebody asks you a question that's not the right question, you be like Jesus and you answer a question with the question. And you say, I hear that, but let me ask you something. And then ask a better question because the wrong question leads to the wrong answer. And you've got way too much to do to spend a lot of time answering the wrong question. It would be better, amen. I feel God on this because I don't kid around a whole lot. You've got something to do. And sometimes you'll get sidetracked by majoring on the minors to get caught up in conversations you should not be having. And so don't spend time doing that because you've got other things to do. Ask a new question and then talk about that. I will take one last one, but I do feel like I'm almost through and I feel like there's much for you to continue to talk about. So know that we're not done. We've just done what we were supposed to do tonight. Who's the last question and then I'm out. Um, I didn't necessarily have a question, but I actually wanted to add it to what my brother David, David said um, about my white brothers and sisters interacting with whitenesses and beginning to develop relationships with people of color um, to better experience what that means out of just your own context. Um, that does not mean go and find one black friend or one Asian friend, and, and, and as, as funny as it sounds, it's exhausting to us to have to explain what your whiteness is um, as it relates to our identity and um, how we do life. And so go and find a plethora of people to engage with so that you don't exhaust that one and have us stressed out because that's what happens here at Trinity. And so engage with people and not just one person um, and that's, that was, uh, I think that's absolutely right. I am, I am, <laughs> I am honored by what has happened in this room tonight. It's been civil, it's been uh, life-giving, it's been honest, I believe it's been engaging. I think it's uncovered a conversation that will be ongoing. Um, publicly, I have already told you that I love Peter Cha and I love Phyllis Cha. Um, I have a daughter who is 21 years old, and um, I learned that we were having a girl because Phyllis Cha was the first person to tell me that our baby was a girl. So I love her godparents. Um, these are my friends, and um, I do believe that what changes our lives and changes our perspectives is when we have skin in the game. When we have somebody we love and people who love us, we can't make the generalizations and the stereotypical beliefs about those people that we would have otherwise. Um, 
I have people in my life, Latino people, Korean people, who change what I think. And when I hear stereotypical things, I'm able to say, that's not true of my sister. That's not true of my brother. These are my friends. And so for all of us, we are living in a society that's demanding more of us. And we've got to be intentional about putting ourselves in the places to be changed. God bless you. Thank you for your time.